To the indigenous inhabitants, the Gumbangia nation was a land of plenty. Around 1500 strong, they lived within dense subtropical forest, roaming between the Nambucca and Clarence rivers and out west to Ebor. Compared to Aborigines elsewhere along the coastal strip, their contact with white settlers came relatively late. In 1770, James Cook had discovered the Solitary Isles, and in 1779, Matthew Flinders added five more to what Cook had described. But it was to be another 70 years before explorers made land. A southerly gale forced London-born Captain John Corfe to shelter his ship Brothers in the relative safety of what is now the harbour in 1847. Others may have preceded him, but Corfe was the first to report his find to authorities. It's believed a slip of the pen, a change from K to C and the deletion of R, was responsible for the area being gazetted Coffs Harbour in 1861. The Clarence and Bellinger River valleys and the New England were already settled, but the lack of a navigable river entrance and the steepness of the western escarpment meant the first pioneers didn't arrive in Coffs Harbour until the mid-1870s. Those first settlers, an overflow from north and south, came in search of timber, particularly cedar, initially from Bonville, Coffs Harbour and Upper Rara. The discovery of gold at Nana Glen in 1881 brought more people to the area, and with government funding granted for a road over Red Hill in 1889, the township of Coffs Harbour began to take shape. Shops were built, a mail service was put in place, a school established, and the lobbying began for a jetty to be built. Approval came quickly and it was completed in 1892 at the grand cost of around £12,000, a remarkable achievement for a community of only 300 residents. The growth of Coffs Harbour was relatively slow over the next decade. The exports of timber from the jetty didn't live up to expectations and the discovery of gold at Caramba saw it become the commercial hub of the area, surrounded as it was becoming by dairy farms. Also in 1914, the council approved the building of the first council chambers in Gale Street. The land cost £200 and the building just over £1,050. In 1915, council bought its first motor vehicle, which led to the first applications coming before council to build garages and for speed limits to be put in place. An outbreak of disease at the jetty saw council unsuccessfully apply for state government funding to upgrade the town's drainage system. Council oversaw the opening of the Headland Quarry in 1914-15 and considered a public holiday for the laying of the first southern breakwater stone in 1917. Council approved a road to be formed to get patients to the hospital. It denied a request that all curbing be done in concrete rather than timber, saying it would treble the cost. Council approved the erection of a temporary hospital at the showground to cope with an influenza outbreak. In 1920, the Pier Hotel was denied permission to dump septic waste into a sawdust pit at the rear of the premises. But council did approve funding for a tarpaulin to cover the sanitary cart. The settlement of Coffs Harbour was starting to thrive and a succession of elected councils were kept busy providing governance and finding the funds to provide services, all the while lobbying the state government to improve basic infrastructure, such as the completion of the railway line and harbour break walls, the provision of schools, medical police and postal services, even banking facilities. It was also under pressure back then to provide and upgrade cultural and sporting facilities. Coffs Harbour was very much a working class town. The residents laboured long and hard and took advantage of every opportunity to relax and unwind. Football, tennis and cricket were the dominant sports. Horse racing had an early following. The Coffs Harbour Surf Club was one of the first established outside Sydney. But you couldn't beat Coffs Creek it was popular for everything from diving competitions to swimming carnivals. In 1921, the Advocates editor V.F. Bacon wrote, Let us admit that Coffs today is a town almost hideous in its ugliness. Except for a few stately homes, not unlike those on South Solitary Island, and a couple of brick hotels, the urban scene was one of box-like wooden houses, unlined, unpainted and fronting tracks that were bog holes in the wet and dust bowls when dry, the town surrounded by dead ring-barked trees. Top Town was developing a business retail focus, the jetty was an industrial hub and Caramba the seat of government. 
but there are only six miles of form streets in Coffs Harbour. Cattle and dogs roamed the streets, and after World War I, there were shanty towns at Park Beach and south of the Coffs Creek mouth. The situation came to a head in 1946, when council applied to the Department of Local Government for the proclamation of an urban area. What followed was the striking of an urban rate of three pence in the pound to fund planned civic improvements and beautification, and the development of an urban plan. Interestingly, it included provision for an eastern highway bypass of the town centre from the golf club to Macaulay's headland. That initial urban plan catered for a population of 10,000 and put the brakes on urban sprawl. It also rekindled debate on relocating the Shire headquarters from Caramba to new chambers in Coffs Harbour. The state government initially rejected a subsequent application on the basis that scant post-war supplies were needed for home building. It relented though and in 1951 Mrs Archibald's house in High Street was transformed into the new chambers for the Dorigo Shire Council. The relocation of the council headquarters also refocused attention on Coffs Harbour's untidiness. People were living in garages, streets were dirty and drains carried offensive effluent. By order of council, unsightly veranda posts were removed from the town centre. Stock were barred from being tethered in the main street and it lobbied for the construction of better Aboriginal housing on the corner of Wulgooga Road and Arthur Street. All the while there was momentum for Coffs Harbour to be declared a municipality. In 1954, the Dorigo Shire Council asked the Minister for Local Government to reallocate the Shire boundaries. And on January the 1st, 1957, the area from Repton to Corindai Beach and west to Brooklana and Nana Glen became Coffs Harbour Shire, with W.H. Bailey elected the first president and A.E. Hogman his deputy. Despite a generous natural rainfall, the supply of water and the disbursement of water were always issues for the councils of the developing settlement. In 1935, council sought the support of the state government for a comprehensive reticulation scheme to replace a weir on Coffs Creek. The bill for a supply main from the Arara River was £36,000 and included tunnelling for 400 feet under Red Hill and the building of the Beacon Hill Reservoir. In 1938, the first 120 homes were connected. As the city grew and fearing water shortages, council built Karangi Dam in 1980, raised it by 10 metres in 1994, and since 2000 has been working with North Coast Water towards a regional water scheme based around a dam at Shannon Creek. Flooding of the town centre was also a recurring problem with councils as far back as 1935, seeking loans to address drainage problems. Of course, the issue came to a spectacular head 10 years ago, in 1996, when a massive downpour resulted in the city being inundated and one life lost. That catastrophic event gave council the leverage to get the funds to finally address city centre drainage issues and forced insurance companies to change forever how they treated subsequent claims. Being on a high rainfall coastal plain has also presented plenty of challenges when it came to waste disposal. Outbreaks of sickness in the early days of settlement highlighted the need for improved sanitation. The Council of 1938 called for tenders for a garbage service to complement the night soil service, but it wasn't until 1944 that planning for a sewerage system was underway, and it would not be until 1960 that Coffs Harbour became a sewered town. But the failure to plan for a rapidly growing population was soon apparent. When Council proposed an ocean outfall at Emerald Beach, the level of opposition put the issue squarely in the national spotlight. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. How do you feel? We shall not be moved. I'm Alf Williams, and in 1991, I was one of those people lying his body and soul down to protect this stunning headland. The People's Revolution that was Look at Me Now was the start of Coffs Harbour's evolution into the equitable and environmentally responsible city it is today. My comrades were no radical greenies, but mums and dads, surfers, grandparents and kids. They defied the police, blocked the bulldozers, and joined hands around the headland to tell the council and the rest of the world they wanted transparency in local government and an input into how Coffs Harbour was to develop. Despite what at times seemed insurmountable odds, the outfall was not built. Instead, a community came of age. This headland, with all its environmental and Aboriginal heritage, was saved. The legacy of Look At Me Now is something that can't be seen or smelt. 
the city's cutting-edge $160 million sewerage strategy. Pivotal to it, a pipeline from the city's water reclamation plant under the North Coast Rail Line, through the dunes and under the sand to a deep sea discharge one and a half kilometres of Boambi Beach. It was a bold and sometimes fraught project, but Boambi Beach and the waters which lap it are now testament to the vision of the strategy. Then again, modern Coffs Harbour, as opposed to its clear felling past, has a proud tradition of environmental awareness and innovation. That's probably best seen in the development of the regional botanic gardens. This jewel in Coffs Harbour's crown had a less than auspicious beginning. Half of the area was once cleared and used as a rubbish tip and a night soil dump by the city council. In 1972 it was discovered by the Eulatara Society who rallied public support for its use as a botanic garden. The council eventually agreed and the voluntary group the Friends of the Garden was formed. And so, 13 years after its discovery, the first sods were turned and the beautification of the 20 hectare site began. The Botanic Garden features plantings of regional threatened species, some with only 10 plants still alive in the wild. There are display gardens featuring plants from subtropical regions of the world and a water-wise demonstration garden. Just as Council was pivotal to the development of the regional botanic gardens, it's been at the forefront of moves to improve, enhance and protect the area's natural environment, implementing an environmental levy to raise the necessary funds. One project in particular has captured not just local, but national attention, the rehabilitation of the Arara River. Decades of overclearing river flats, the invasion of environmental weeds, and the extraction of gravel and water has taken a toll on the Arara. Our river was in danger of dying. But slowly, the tide is being turned. Over 200 people, mostly volunteers, work on a variety of projects on 85 kilometres of our rivers and creeks. We've fenced out livestock, installed off-stream watering points, tackled weeds, replanted thousands of native trees, constructed log jams, groins and rock ramps to improve channel stability, in-stream aquatic habitat, and improve water quality. What's really driven this huge project though, has been funding from Coffs Harbour City Council's environmental levy. We've used those funds to access grants from the federal government's Natural Heritage Trust. And along the way, we've acquired a very high profile for the project and strong partnerships too. These root balls were donated by contractors on a new highway diversion 40 kilometres from here. The pins are from State Forest, free of royalty payments. And Project Big Fish is working to restock the river with eastern freshwater cod, a once abundant species now threatened with extinction. The Arara project is now a model for other restoration projects Australia-wide. Uh, a star uh, as you looked at. 